Angela Bandon Bogard. Uh, it was a very revealing st statement. It's it's surprising how often people give really interesting, useful information away in court statements when they they don't they don't realise the, the significance of what they're saying. And she said that when she was training people in her eyes and when she was explaining how this, what the system was and how it worked, she would use the analogy of a, an electronic calculator. And she would say that Horizon is just like a big calculator. You press the buttons, it does the calculations and you get out the answer. And that's exactly what Horizon wasn't. It was so much bigger and more complex than that. And the complexity is an important point because a complex system like Horizon is not like a simple yeah. machine. Yeah. It should have been their job to try and find out what was going on. And they clearly saw their job as being to earn bonuses or brownie points by getting convictions, by yeah. allowing the post office to recover money that had never been lost. Well, the, one, of the, one of the very naive aspects of it is illustrated by Gary Brown, who's, who we've also interviewed, who was, he commented that he'd never worked in finance before and he was taken by surprise during the training to be told by the trainer, which only lasted half a day or something, but to be told by the trainer that what he needed was a tin. And if there was an excess of money on his um, balancing, he should put it in the tin. And when there was a deficit, he should take it out of the tin <laughs> And one thing you should always be careful to do is to avoid <laughs> to avoid balancing precisely, because when that happened, it would bring the auditors down on him like a ton of coals, because nobody ever balanced exactly. <laughs> and then he commented sweetly that he was surprised by this because he'd never worked in finance before. <laughs> oh dear. The group, the group chief auditor for whom I worked had a nice turn of phrase. And he'd say, I remember he used to say things like, I'm afraid we're dealing with a bunch of intellectual inadequates here. Um, and I'm not talking about Gary. Um, well, when I, I've been looking at watching the interviews that you've been doing, with sub postmasters and also with Ian Ross, that was a very interesting one. And the impression that I've got is that the people who are investigating these alleged frauds were just out of their depth. Everyone was out of their depth. The poor sub postmasters, they were suddenly dragged into a world that was totally alien to them. And the investigators clearly didn't really know what they were doing. They didn't know what they were looking for. They didn't know they clearly didn't know how to go about investigating a computer-related fraud. And they were responding to that just with bullying, with intimidation. You know, when I've worked on a fraud, we've, it's been a matter of trying to understand what's been going on. At the start, I know nothing. I don't understand what's happened. And you try to piece all the data together, all the information that you can gather together to understand what's been going on. And these investigators at the post office, they didn't know what was going on. They didn't understand it. And they responded simply by jumping to the firm conclusion that the sub postmasters were guilty. And then their job was to try and bully them into confessing. It should have been their job to try and find out what was going on. And they clearly saw their job as being to earn bonuses, or brownie points, by getting convictions, by mm. allowing the post office to recover money that had never been lost. They were clearly never trying to find out what had happened because there were issues being raised by the post, sub-postmasters that should have had technical investigators mm. crawling over the system, trying to understand, trying to make sense of what was said, trying to make sense of the discrepancies to understand how they could have arisen. You cannot simply investigate a computer, suspected computer related fraud by jumping to a conclusion. You've got to try, you've got to try and follow the evidence all the way through the system, through the data. You've got to go back to the raw data and piece everything together to, to try and understand from all this mass of data, this confusion, what was going on. Because we, a, a piece of data on its own is 
meaningless because a system's never going to say James Christie committed a fraud, took ten thousand pounds, eleven o'clock on Tuesday, the twenty eighth of September. No, it's it's not how it works. But the Horizon investigators were, in effect, assuming that that was the case. That Horizon would say a discrepancy had arisen, and that was all the proof that they needed uh, that the supposed master was guilty. I think it's very interesting, though. You will have seen Nicola Arch's interview, I know, but we, we've interviewed mm. another postmistress called Wendy Buffery, and we're going to yeah. release her interview quite quickly. Yeah. And what she, yeah. what both of them did was pour over the information for hours on end to try to mm. work out what the Horizon system had done to get them into this position. So, in fact, they spent more time trying to investigate what yes. had happened than any of the investigators did. Yes, but they were only able to work with what with the information yes. Yes, that Horizon course. was giving them. Yes, of course. Uh, when, when I was working, I was a real back office investigator. I never actually met a fraudster face to face. It was my job to go back to the raw data, back as far as possible. Um, so what, that I, I was not working with reports. I was not working with online inquiries. I was going back to the raw data to put it together to try and understand what might have happened. Uh, often on a a fraud investigation, uh, I'd just be called and told to drop what I was doing. And I'd just be given a name. And my brief would be, find out all you can about what this person's been doing. And I wouldn't be told about what they were sus suspected of. And I would just draw in all the everything that they'd been working on. And I'd put it together, looking for patterns, discrepancies, anything that might be significant. And then that would give provide the, the real investigators, the ones that would deal with the fraudsters face to face, that would give them something to work on. And they'd try and find out something a bit more. And I'd take their information, feed it back in, and see if I could find out more from the data. But the important thing was to go through, it was through tens of millions of records over many years, seeing what people had been doing, looking for patterns, looking for discrepancies, looking for things that were out of the ordinary. We used a statistical analysis package called SAS, and it was incredibly powerful. And it, you could it, you could spot patterns and things that were matching that didn't really quite make sense. And you could keep piecing it together, keep sorting the data, cutting it in different ways, and you you keep learning about what was going on. And this raises the issue about confirmation bias, doesn't it? You had to. As I understand, oh, you, had to, yeah. you had to start without knowing what it was that you, the, the person was suspected of. I understand that even fingerprint experts are biased if they're told what the subject is suspected of um, and, and they misread yeah. fingerprints as a result of that. So you have to go blank yeah. without, without any prejudice into these investigations, don't you? Yes, and th there's one case I'd like, I'll probably keep referring to because it had all the classic features and that was a case where I was just given this guy's name. He worked at Preston Branch, or Preston Branch. I was just given his name because so we'd had an anonymous phone call that had come into internal audit, somebody wanting to speak to those who worked on fraud investigations. It was passed through to us. And the call was simply, you should take a look at what this guy, and it was named at your Preston Branch, has been doing. Mm. And... The manager thought, OK, well, we'll see. And so I was just given that name. And I just went back. He, I, he worked as a, um, a claims team leader processing insurance claims. And I remember an insurance company, it exists to take in money and pay it out. It's paying out millions of pounds a day. It does, not, it does nothing but churn the money around and pay it out. And so it's... It's a really easy target for fraud, internal fraud. That was, a, oh, that was always a big problem. So I, I looked at what this guy had been doing. He was working on claims. And so I was looking at the type of claims he was working on. Um, I had all the, the claims records and the check payment records associated with these claims. I was going trawling through tens of millions of records over eight years, it was, that I pulled it all together. And there were some interesting patterns like, he worked on an unusually high number of third-party accident claims where one of our policyholders had drowned somebody and 
we had to pay out a few thousand pounds to somebody else from another who was insured with another company for damage to their car. And that's always, uh, that was a very popular um, area for fraud, these third, third party accidents. And another thing was that I spotted the same amount, the same payment amount going out a few times. I saw s- several duplicates and that's an even bigger warning sign because that's an indication that um, somebody's recycling invoices to set up a duplicate, right. a duplicate claim. Yeah. And we, we kept on pulling it together, looking at the data in different ways, seeing where the checks were going. Because in the bad old days, uh, I, if I stole a check that was made out to George Hibbert uh, for £5,000, I could just walk into a bank and open an account in the name of George and then immediately withdraw all the money. And banks would let you do that. But they'd clamp down on that. So in order to open an account, it's you have to go through a formal process of identifying yourself. And that made it much more difficult for the, the fraudsters to, uh, to get their hands on the money from these checks. And so we had, in that case, we saw the same name coming up repeatedly as PEs because it was somebody whose bank account the fraudster had access to, somebody who was, who was taking a cut to allow their bank account to launder the, the fraud. And so you'd see the same name coming up and you'd see the same addresses coming up for different PEs. And it's, it's extremely easy to hide an, hide an address. Think of how many different ways you could uh, write your address down and be confident that a letter would still get to you. Mm -hmm. Like two comma space anywhere road or two space anywhere road, spell anywhere differently, put RD instead of road. And so you might think, well, rely on the postcode to get matching addresses. But the post office being so responsible and professional, (laughs) Royal Mail rather, that was just, they will, they will, um, they'll still deliver the address, the, the, the letter if the postcode is wrong. So mm. we had to keep up, we'd keep on matching the data. We'd see um, somebody, we'd see the same PAE getting checks at what were slightly different addresses. Mm. And so we'd, We'd see then we'd see that PA coming up at a completely different address, and we'd look at what had gone to that address, mm. and then we'd use that to see to link back in to build a network of all the different PAs, the different addresses, uh, and in that case, it came up to it was five hundred and fifty-five, uh, and it nothing actually none of these. 555 fraudulent checks was suspicious on its own. It was only when you're able to match it with others and mm-hmm. you could show how it all linked together. You could sh- show how the same address is being used repeatedly to take checks, but they were always being spelt slightly differently. But we we're able to see that it was linked because it was the same P or it was this, exactly the same amount that had been used elsewhere, going to another P, to another address. And it was 555 payments that were all tightly linked with in these different ways. Mm-hmm. And what they had in common was that all had been authorized by one person at our Preston branch. And it, right. took, it took several days to piece all that together. Well, you say and, days. I mean, if we look at the post office situation, they were taking years to so-called investigate. I mean, people didn't end up in court well, for yes, but, ages. You had they had the days to do the investigation if they wanted to do it, didn't they? Yes. I mean, it was this is it was the most urgent thing I, w- I was working on. I was working long hours and through the weekends to get as much mm. solid information together as I could as quickly as possible. And this is this is about gathering evidence, isn't it? Actual evidence rather than and a single bizarre finding on the computer. Yes, and it was how it all meshed together. Yes. 
And that it, one, one check out of that 555 was meaningless, but put together, it was a really compelling story of how one person had been working a fraud over many years. It was possible, you could say, you could tell what he'd been doing, how he'd been doing it, um, recycling invoices, uh, raising fraudulent, raising non-existent claims, and then pushing the checks out to go with it. And he had been really quite careful. Uh, he was never being too greedy. He was taking a few thousand pounds a week, week after week, year after year. And that adds up. Yes. <laughs> he, he'd taken over, it was 1.1 million pounds he'd taken. Mm. And he had the good sense to live about 30 miles away from where he worked. And he had a big house that was completely right. uh, implausible yeah. for the job he was doing. But he was quite discreet uh, at the office. None of his neighbours, they assumed he had a big swanky job in insurance. Yeah. Uh, and But none of the people he worked with thought that he had a, a, a very lucrative, you know, wealthy lifestyle because he, he kept all that well hidden from them, and he was he'd settled in for the long haul. There are <laughs> so many the there are so many interesting parallels with the post office people, or at least not parallels, but discrepancies. I mean, first we we hear from Nicola that the amount that was discrepant in her computer records was doubling um, at, at a regular rate when she did certain things. In other words, if she'd kept doubling it, she'd have been she'd have been owing the post office millions within a, a few weeks and um that uh, just seems utterly implausible that's not the way fraudsters work <laughs> <laughs> the, the kind of fraudster like uh, our guy tom it was just skimming a few thousand pounds a week i mean that's that's a nice that's a nice lifestyle but, but, you wouldn't want to get promoted into a job where you, <laughs> where you had to manage people you could do that yeah, and James, you had given the investigators a wonderful array of material to take to an interview and say, explain this. You know, we have well, these it, things. It was, it was so compelling that uh, we, did, we did, didn't did, do that. We didn't need to. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, the, the group chief auditor and his deputy just took the printouts into a car and they drove down the road and went to the police station, a police station impressed and said, will you take a look at this? Mm. And uh, the, the Lancashire Frauds Code were quite happy to work with it because yeah. Yeah. Um, they had almost everything they needed. And, and that's fact, what was so... the policeman would have used that in their interviews of him and shown him what a good case they got. <laughs> you know, that's how um, it works. Or, or he would have already put his hands up, I suppose. That's another option. Yeah, because... Um, We'd, we worked on a strict need-to-know basis. Nobody knew that we were investigating a fraud. I wasn't even allowed to say I was working on a fraud. Uh, I was just doing the same old, same old stuff mm. as far as my friends were concerned, my, uh, my colleagues outside the audit department. And um, it was important that people didn't get any clue that there might have been, there was any suspicion. And so the police looked at the evidence. They identified 13 addresses that we'd given them that had been used to launder checks. And they decided that this was strong enough to get warrants for these 13 addresses and arrest warrants for the, the PEs if they were living at these addresses. And they just yeah. went steaming in uh, at six o'clock in the morning. And that's the only time in my life that I've uh, slept badly because mm -hmm. of work. Because I knew about the implications, I knew that the, on the basis of my work, the police were going to be starving into people's homes. And if, you know, if I'd screwed up, if I'd got it wrong, yeah, that, that would be awful. Yes. Yeah. And, yes. Uh, but the, the police, um, they took everyone by surprise. And the guy who is the ringmaster was caught out so badly that he had a whole lot of incriminating evidence kept in his garage. Oh dear. And he just had he just had to put his hands up. Yeah. Uh, and so all the evidence I'd gathered was never was never never had to be used in court because he you know, he pleaded guilty. Well, uh, the, the the parallel with the postmistresses and postmasters again is that they are they do appear to be mild mannered people working in the post office without any apparent 
uh, wealth there. So if they were stealing tens of thousands, they would have had to be able to hide it uh, somehow. And they, they miraculously were hiding it very successfully, unlike your man in Preston, who clearly didn't hide it very successfully. He had stuff in his garage. Which... <laughs> he, lived in a nice, he lived in a nice suburb of Liverpool. Yeah. Yeah, 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 but his family. He had a fam- He had there were six in the family, and they he'd go off on a holiday, and he'd just, he was you know off to North Wales or whatever, but or New York. But it was it, they actually went to places like Hawaii. Yes, well, the, the postmasters were better at hiding out. their wealth, weren't they? Because <laughs> they were prosecuted without ever anybody even finding it, and yes, it's a, an ex- extraordinary yes, achievement. Yes, all of them, all the frauds I worked on, there was there was some evidence, there was some sign that people had spent the money. You know, there was one guy, his manager said, I was his manager was was famed for being a sharp dresser and wearing expensive suits. And after the, the young guy working for him was arrested, he said, I was wondering why he was wearing better suits than me. <laughs> I was wondering, I knew, I knew how much these suits cost. I was wondering how much you, how you could afford it. <laughs> yeah, well, we knew. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It, it's, in, it's interesting to imagine, isn't it? People approaching the work, though, from the, the perspective of the, the way the post office did it. I mean, to just, to just turn up and believe that you can bludgeon, really, a confession out of people by saying that, you know, the horizon system works. Yeah. There isn't a problem. And I know a thief and I see one. The investigators don't, didn't understand um, IT systems. They didn't understand complex IT systems that are going wrong in small ways all the time. And people are working hard to keep the thing going. And you're always getting small problems cropping up. And what might be a small problem uh, for a massive system like Horizon that was dealing with millions of pounds a day, what might be a small problem for the system as a whole could be a really huge problem, a huge discrepancy for an individual branch's accounts. Mm. And that was something that they didn't really seem to understand. They, they had been, they thought the system was almost 100% reliable. Well, almost 100% reliable when you're dealing with thousands of people. And millions of pounds a day means that these edge cases, you know, not 0.1%, you know, one in a thousand cases or one in 10,000, they're happening all the time. Mm -hmm. And the fact that a discrepancy has happened doesn't mean that there's a 99.9% chance that it must have been a fraud because the the system is 99.9% reliable. It's like, you know, the, what are the odds of winning the, a jackpot on the lottery? Say one in 20 million. But that happens every week. That doesn't mean that if somebody gets you know, a 10 million pound in their bank account, the odds are 20 million to one against that person having won the lottery. Mm. That's the prosecutor's fallacy, isn't it? Um, yes, you sorry. had um, ref- a reference from a statement that you said you'd read um, for the court, uh, one of the directors describing what Horizon was like, um, James. Yes, and Angela Vanden Bogard. Uh, it was a very revealing st- statement. It's, it's surprising how often people give really interesting, useful information away in court statements when they they don't, they don't realise the significance of what they're saying. And she said that when she was training people in Horizon, when she was explaining how this, what the this system was and how it worked, she would use the analogy of a, an electronic calculator. And she would say that Horizon is just like a big calculator. You press the buttons, it does the calculations, and you get out the answer. And that's exactly what Horizon wasn't. It was so much bigger and more complex than that. And the complexity is an important point because a complex system like Horizon is not like a simple machine where the different cogs and wheels work together in a very predictable manner. Horizon's full of different, very complicated elements that are constantly changing or being changed. And the system evolves and adapts in ways that are quite unpredictable. 
even though it is a computer-based system and software is predictable in the sense that you can look at a bit of code and it will always behave the same way with the same piece of data. That's not the case with a huge system like Horizon. The data is always changing. Different components are changing and the behavior becomes unpredictable. You cannot simply assume that like a calculator, if you press five plus four equals, you get nine and you'll always get nine. That is quite definitely not the case with a system like Horizon. And people who have worked with these complex, massively complex systems understand that. They know that its behavior is unpredictable, that changes are always being made, changes that the system experts might not know about. People, and also people use them in unpredictable ways. The data is always changing. That, that's something that causes always causes big problems. You think you know the limits of what the data is, but that changes because of regulation or technology. Or, there are all sorts of reasons why the data can change that you're working with. And the system has to keep be constantly amended to make sure that it's still doing the job it, it is required to do. It's not like... Um, Something like a calculator, you buy it, you start it up, and all you have to do is change the batteries. These big systems like Horizon have got big teams who are working constantly, uh, changing the system, adapting it, make, keeping it relevant, keeping it working, fixing all these little, little problems that have to be fixed before they become huge problems, making sure the system remains compliant with the law. Combined so, with the business needs. So, and, so presumably, if something happens which a sub postmaster, for example, flags up as being a problem, they you know they ask for help. There's something happening which, which they don't understand. For example, a, 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 in in Wendy's case, a batch of stamps appearing in her um, stock which she hadn't ordered. Um, that is a signal for people to try and find out what's going wrong. Quite apart from it should be yes a, a signal to investigate if you if you turn out if it turns out that you have to investigate. Um, the investigation should be further down the line. Yes, um, the first question is what's gone wrong. Be, yeah, yeah, it should be passed back to the software developers um, to look into it, and they'd call it, they might call another technical experts, uh, but. Things are always going wrong with these systems, mm. and you need these, and that's why you've got a. <laughs> when I worked, it was called the maintenance the maintenance teams, which is they thought that was a slightly demeaning phrase, but that that was what it was. You need constant maintenance of these systems to keep them going. Yeah. And what you don't want is a system which is putting people in prison unnecessarily, of course, but they didn't seem to care. Well, it wasn't a system that did, did that. It's, it was the people. It was the appalling management culture. That's true. Um, I'm not sure that Horizon was necessarily much worse than many other systems, but it, it was the way it was used and the, right. the post office's refusal to acknowledge that the system might be flawed. All systems are flawed, mm. but they can still be useful. And I think it was... It was Nicola, was it, who said that one of the things that when her, the investigation of her case started, she said that um, her daily reconciliation was OK. Yes. But, yes, the weekly but not the weekly. Was out. That's, that's right. right. Well, that, I mean, that's something that should have been thrown straight back to the, 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 the Horizon team to look, is, is this possible? How could this have happened? Um, and I know I, I it was a rival insurance company had a big fraud related to that where they discovered uh, it was possible to um, retrospectively put data through for a previous day after it had been reconciled. Huh. So, uh, and they only did daily reconciliations. They didn't do a weekly reconciliation that would have spotted that. And that was something that I actually, we used to swap information with our rivals. Yeah, we had contacts. That was part of our job to build up contacts doing the same job at Rivals because we were all after the same. We, we all, as auditors and investigators, we all had the same ends. We wanted yeah. to get the same people. They were the enemy. 
Yeah. Yeah. I worked, for, you know, Commercial Union or Norwich Union. They weren't our rivals as far as I was concerned. They were people who could help us. Yes. And th so we'd swap information about frauds and about techniques for catching the fraudsters. And yeah, they told us about one that um, they had because of a similar problem. People were able to get past the daily reconciliation. And we found a system where it was possible to do that. And we could have been defrauded, but we were able to put a stop to that because of the swapping of uh, information between supposed rivals. Mm. But uh, yeah, that really jumped out at me when I heard Nicola say that. You know, the daily reconciliation was right. The weekly was wrong. Well, that, yeah. The only investigation That's... that seemed to happen was uh, a visit by what they called auditors who went and did yeah. something invisible in the post office booth and, and in fact, seemed to have unable to count money properly either. But well, that, it, no, that was Wendy. Was it was never clear money. what the auditors were doing. Uh, yeah. I, I don't regard these people as being real auditors because auditing is a fairly demanding, high level job that you need very competent and bright people to do. Mm. And what the. I have a danger of sounding arrogant here, but uh, we had auditors for our work that were up to the job, and the post office auditors weren't genuine auditors. They were really compliance checkers, cash checkers, checking that the cash matched the system. They weren't even, uh, they didn't even report to internal audit. Mm. They were a, a separate team that internal audit was supposed to oversee uh, right. to keep an eye on what they were doing. It's uh, what the auditing, um, I found an extremely interesting and intellectually challenging job. Uh, it would have driven me mad being a post office branch auditor because that just would seem to be mind numbingly boring. Even if I was doing the job properly and responsibly, which they would weren't there was somebody wasn't there who did give evidence in in a court hearing actually saying that the system was robust and there there wasn't a problem with it that that's my understanding um well, that, that was the, the the post office's um, expert witness in the yes. horizon issues trial yeah uh well yeah yeah, he was just looking at things the wrong way around. And this is picked up by Justice Fraser, mm. uh, who, who really rejected his evidence. He was, it was a similar point to what I was making earlier. The argument of this expert was that given that the system was 99.9% .9 reliable, the chances ah. um, of, yeah, the chances of a discrepancy uh, at a branch being, being an error were one in whatever. Uh, it was actually one in millions that he came up with. But that was exactly the wrong way of looking at it as, as the judge spotted. Um, given that you're dealing with millions of cases, if only one in 10,000 is going wrong, if, 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 you, if you've got 10, 10 million transactions, one in 10,000 goes wrong. That's still a thousand where you've got a discrepancy. And it's no good to say, look, look at one of these, say, well, it must have been a fraud because it's only a one in 10,000 right. chance that it could have been an accident. It's already happened. And the chance that the original, the original reason for that is not the same, for that arising, is not the same as the chance that the person... Um, who's reported it, is guilty or was responsible for it. So was the expert it's, an IT professional? Was the expert somebody who he, would have... Yeah, he was, but he... he. It was... He was clearly a very intelligent and experienced and knowledgeable man, but I think maybe it was a case of confirmation bias. Right. He believed the system was reliable. He wanted to believe it was reliable. And he set off on a chain of logic and spurious statistical argument that really made no sense. Goodness. And, uh, 
but it, it was good enough to fool. Yeah, that line of reasoning was good enough to fool the court and the horizon prosecutions. Yeah. It's it's not only you know, the, the prosecution were irresponsible, unethical, uh, running these arguments in their prosecutions, but there have to be questions of the defense too, not spotting the the fallacies that the prosecution were committing knowingly or unwittingly. People working in IT and people working on computer fraud investigations have to be meticulous about the, the evidence they gather, the data they work with, so that they, they can be confident that there is as good a chain as possible from the raw data through to, as Ian Ross puts it, from data through to information, through to evidence that can be presented in court that will present a compelling story of why that person committed the fraud mm. and so that you can prove that beyond reasonable doubt. And if something that we would constantly think about was where the weaknesses were, potential weaknesses were in our argument, uh, in our evidence, and we would focus on that to see how we could strengthen that to remove doubt. Whereas what the post office's attitude to that problem was, was to ignore that, ignore the weaknesses and to cover them up mm. and to try and bluster their way through. For me, one of the reasons I loved working with computers and I loved working in an internal audit, IT audit was that I wanted to understand what was going on. I wanted to make sense of what was what's happening in this big, confusing corporation. And so that was always my driver. What's going on? Uh, I was never interested. The idea of um, you know, playing the investigation game to win is just anathema to me. Mm. You've got to have people with that sort of questioning mindset who are prepared to beaver away, work away at the data to, to understand what's going on. You need them. Uh, you, you're going to need some hard-nosed investigators too who are prepared to confront suspects and yeah. talk, talk to them if necessary. But that's only once we've got some really good evidence Absolutely. With, to confront them. It's a pity that the defence lawyers didn't get people with my sort of background in yeah. to brief them with the sort of awkward questions that would have been very difficult for the um, the prosecution to, to deal with. Yes. Mm. That, just, to, just to ca repeatedly cast doubt uh, on the evidence they are presenting. Uh, how, can, how can you be sure that it was that person who did it? Uh, well, they logged on. But how can you be sure that only that person logged on? And clearly they didn't have there wasn't adequate control over access control. Uh, there's this, there's a suspicion of uh, login, login IDs being shared. Um, and we know that um, people with high privilege levels were able to retain these all the time. And it gave them the, um, the opportunity to amend data uh, without a trace of what they'd done. That, that doesn't mean they'd done it. But if, you, if the defence was throwing that into the mix, mm. they could have asked the prosecution, how do you know that that wasn't done? Yeah. And if I'd been called into court in that case um, and it had been put to me, how, how do you know that wasn't done? I'd have simply shrugged and said, well, I don't. This may be a silly question, James, but how would somebody find you if they wanted a, a, an expert witness with your kind of knowledge and skills? How would they find you in order to approach you for that kind well, of it, it input? Wouldn't, it wouldn't be me. It would be somebody like me with um, this, with experience and expertise that was specifically relevant to the case yes. in point. Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, first, I suppose the starting point would be just Googling for experts and the particular sort of software technology. Um, how, do, how do you go about finding expert witnesses? And your lawyers, do you know that? Are there panels that, where they're registered? Well, I think there are, but I, I, I think it's very difficult to find people. You don't know what you're getting, James, a lot of the time. Uh, if you're very experienced in a topic and you, you then get to know who the experts are because you use them, you see other people using them. But if, say, yes. this is a kind of case that 
it would be an unusual case, really, because it wouldn't be one that you would be hearing much of, I wouldn't have thought, and you get a post office case. I don't know that anyone would necessarily know who was good. That's the problem. There can be a lot of, there are a lot of experts, but they may not be that good. Um, mm. And but, but I believe that some um, expert witnesses were um, were called in, but the yes, they I don't were. think that they were always used. Um, I well, mean, on 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 the whole, I, a lot of industries have got. Uh, you know, a, a college or a, a registration system, which means you can identify people who've qualified at a certain level, engineering, medicine, etc. You know, you can you can find an expert that way. But presumably in the computer world, it's a, still a bit uh, loose from that point of view. Yes. Yeah, there's we do, we, we're not uh, rigorous professionals the way that um, other mm. that genuine professions are. We're, uh, given what we know now, you wouldn't have had to delve deep into the technology of Horizon to cast doubt in prosecution cases. No. You could have focused on the, on managerial issues, like those in the, the Ernst & Young letter about the, the poor control over high-level privileges. Mm. Um, you could The, the defence could have um, put to the um, post office witnesses and asked them about what form of system audits had been performed on horizon uh, because there's there's a, a whole set of uh, methods and models for auditing um, these complex systems where you have to demonstrate different criteria about security, availability, confidentiality, privacy. And the, the key one in the, the for a system like horizon for these prosecutions would have been processing integrity. What audit have you done to ensure that um, the system can demonstrate processing integrity. And there are various criteria for this idea of processing integrity. What controls are there to show that all processing is complete, that it's all accurate, that everything is, all processing has been authorized by the right person, that everything, that all the data is valid and that everything has been done at the right time. And this is something that auditors should be looking at, at evidence from the system to show that it is fulfilling, that it fits all these criteria. And that's what a really rigorous system mm. audit should do. And clearly we now know that uh, that was not done with Horizon because the, a formal and rigorous audit along those lines uh, would have revealed a whole series of weaknesses and problems that would have ensured that evidence supposedly coming from the system, because it, well, it wasn't real evidence, that the system was not reliable um, for um, evidence in the criminal prosecution. If the defence had had, was aware of these uh, things about how um, these big financial systems should be audited, they would have been able to, they mm -hmm. could have called in um, post office and Fujitsu witnesses and asked them, okay, what rigorous system auditing have yes. you done? You uh, have to ask somebody to come and give the evidence, yeah. And Paula Venels, in a submission to um, a parliamentary committee just last year, said that um, she was satisfied with the reliability of Horizon because it had been subjected to what is called a SAS 70 audit. Now, that means nothing to you, and it meant nothing to the MPs who probably thought that was quite impressive. And she said it that Paul Evans said that's the gold standard for IT audits. Well, there's two problems with that. It's it was obsolete before it it was obs it was dropped in 2011. And she was talking about it about how the post office had responded and um, to problems raised by the Ernst Young letter in 2011 and in 2012. And she's talking about a SAS 70 audit having been done then. It was SAS 70 was obsolete by then and it had been replaced by the sort of audit I was talking about just now. Uh, and the other problem was that um, SAS 70 was an IT installation audit about the way the installation's managed. It doesn't look at how individual systems are controlled. <coughs> SAS 70s 
uh, provides some assurance about whether the installations managed sufficiently well for people to have confidence in financial statements it produces, whether the financial accounts will be reliable coming from that installation. That's at a completely different level. That's obviously very important, but it's a completely different level from the detailed systems audit I was talking, the sort mm. of audit I was talking about, where you're really delving into the workings of the system. And although, excuse me, these are called SOC audits, uh, systems and organizational control audits. But these SOC audits, although they were only introduced about 10 years ago, they were based on existing good practice. They were what IT auditors had been doing for decades before that. And it's something that the post office and Horizon, and, sorry, and Fujitsu should have been doing. But they clearly weren't. Okay. It's really quite significant, I think, that Paula Venels was referring to an obsolete and irrelevant mm. audit model to justify that um, the post office had been doing rigorous system audits. But what you have is people who don't know what they're talking about, talking to people who don't know what they're hearing. (laughs) Exactly, exactly, that's it. It it sounds sounds quite impressive. You're quoting a SAS 70 audit. You know, good jargon there. She she was obviously well briefed, but you know, to an IT auditor, they'd be thinking, but that's not relevant and it's old Mm. stuff anyway. It should have been a completely different type of audit and a more modern and relevant one. Yeah. And but that's that's just indicative of everything that's been going on you know, over the decades. It's all bluff and bluster. Mm-hmm. People who don't, as you put it, George, people who don't know what they're talking about, bluffing their way through, talking to people who don't understand the answers that they're getting. So it's why it's appalling. It's helpful to feed some of the this information out to the experts who could just have a laugh and say, "Well, that's bollocks." <laughs> um, yeah, and, but, but unfortunately, there wasn't. Yeah, you know, that that just didn't happen. Uh, the people who people weren't involved. The sort of people who could have explained what was going on. It you know experienced it auditors who knew what, who knew how the system should be audited, who knew how these complex systems can go wrong and who know how to investigate. Well, the, one, um, of the, one of the very naive aspects of it is illustrated by Gary Brown, who's, who we've also interviewed, who was, he commented that he'd never worked in finance before and he was taken by surprise during the training to be told by the trainer, which only lasted half a day or something, but to be told by the trainer that what he needed was a tin. And if there was an excess of money on his um, balancing, he should put it in the tin. And when there was a deficit, he should take it out of the tin. And one thing you should always be careful to do is to avoid, <laughs> to avoid balancing precisely, because when that happened, it would bring the auditors down on him like a ton of coals, because nobody ever balanced exactly. I mean, he commented sweetly that he was surprised by this because he'd never worked in finance before. <laughs> oh, dear. The group, the group chief auditor for whom I worked had a nice turn of phrase. And he'd say, I remember him, he used to say things like, I'm afraid we're dealing with a bunch of intellectual inadequates here. Um, and I'm not talking about Gary. No, 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 sure. No, he, he understood definitely. that there was something wrong with this yeah. process that he was being well, introduced to. I've never worked with systems like that. Um, <laughs> I, I haven't, um, they didn't I have a can into, like that at um, the bank you worked before for. Before I moved into IT, I actually worked in the investment division of a different insurance company. And uh, because I yeah. had done accountancy at university, I was, I was responsible for managing the foreign currency bank accounts. Uh, especially the the dollar bank accounts, and we were that it was big stuff. Mm. There's there's tens of millions of dollars flowing to and fro through the accounts every day. Investment deals, lots you know, charges um, that brokers were applying, dividends coming in, and the, the poor woman who had been responsible for that previously should lost track. You know, you do a bank reconciliation, mm. your checkbook against the bank statement, and you work out 
why they're they, why they're different because yeah. stuff hasn't been cut. Yeah. Well, as I say, there was hundreds of items going through every day, tens of millions of dollars, and you had to be reconciling constantly. Yeah. And she let things slip for a few days, and lost control, and gone off sick and some stress, <laughs> and it's thrown at me. And I was taught, it was a background job, but to fit in alongside all my other work. And the discrepancy was a few thousand dollars, which is no big deal in the grand scheme of things. But it wasn't an item of a few thousand dollars. It's about three thousand dollars was a discrepancy. And after about a month of working away at this, I'd got the discrepancy down to forty-five thousand dollars because it wasn't one item of three thousand dollars. It was hundreds one way, hundreds the other way mm. that were netting out to three thousand and. By clo- identifying loads of them, I just made the discrepancy bigger. You know, the idea that the I- if you've got a small discrepancy, that's okay. That shows that everything's fine. It's nonsense. <laughs> if you've got things, if you've got things balanced to the penny, to the cent, then the chances are that you've got things under control. <laughs> I, just, I, I really can't. Just, it's possible that I don't understand what was going on at the post office well enough to understand why that might have been a reasonable thing to say. But my instincts and experience just send me in the opposite direction. And uh, if I, yeah, it's... Just seems well, Gary's wife, very, Maureen, very kindly piped up saying she'd worked in retail and in the shop she'd worked out, they hadn't had a can to put <laughs> money in or take out, you know, if they couldn't quite balance at the end of the day. So a she manager knew, had to be... They, they knew something was wrong. But this was how yeah, the post office the, trained people. This was a trainer. Their training, their training was abysmal, and you've got to have, you've got to have really good training for any complex system like yep. that, so that people understand yep. how to work with it. Yeah, I, yeah, I put my foot down once as as an auditor, um, insisting that the training, that uh, an implementation should be delayed. Uh, the development team and the users were under huge pressure from on high to get this system in. And I put my foot down saying, no, it's going to be delayed because it's going to be rolled out across all the mm. hundred odd branches around the country over a period of two months with people being um, press ganged into training over those two months. Uh, and it was scheduled for the middle of July to the middle of September when branches were going to have to release people for training. Now, can you see a problem with that? I can. <laughs> a few. <laughs> they were going to do it across the English school holidays. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> the excuse was, oh, well, it's holidays are different in Scotland. <laughs> oh, but, dear. Uh, and, you know, that that was going to cause enough of a problem that people were not, not enough people were going to get good enough training. And mm. it was so important that they get the good training that despite all the pressure, I said, no, we in order are going to put our foot down. We were not allowed to take executive decisions, but we could say we'll put our foot down and if you go against us, we will escalate this to the highest possible level. And the development team and the users with whom I was dealing were relieved because that meant the pressure was off them. Yeah. They'd been ordered to do it as fast as possible. But then they could say, well, sorry, we've tried, but audit yeah. have been real hard, those so-and-sos, and we can't. And so we, we got them off the hook. But training was, was so important. 